Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so, uh, I'm not going to answer this question, but um, this was sort of the... <laughs> uh, this was a, a question that I started to uh, consider when I joined the lab. And I don't know if it's sort of... I found it almost like a parody if you, if you try to Google what prefrontal cortex does, that you just get gigantic lists that have, you know, everything that the brain does on it. And um, so I remember looking at, you know, list after list after list, trying to make sense of it. And um, uh, finally, it seemed to, uh, I sort of realized, especially because when I realized that this Miller-Cohen paper has 15,000 citations, you know, there must be, there must be some, um, some core truth to, uh, to the, the following observation about uh, something core that PFC does, which is to um, uh, guide um, sort of the low level, guide the, the sort of mapping between inputs and outputs in lower level areas depending on hidden states that are like maybe like maintained in working memory. So, um, so the classic example of this is the Stroop task where humans, for example, are asked to either state the the text of the color or name the color in which the text is written and um, and then they have to dynamically switch between these two modes and people with lesions to prefrontal cortex uh, are unable to do this task they'll just perseverate on one of the two strategies and if you recapitulate this kind of task in animals you see a similar deficit but um as I started to read more about this and look at more um, sort of modern uh, computational theories of PFC function, I realized that there's actually kind of um, two, two different frameworks that now exist and are now advertised as, as uh, computational theories of PFC that are both compatible with this same function. So one is the idea that prefrontal cortex is actually just a gigantic extension of, of premotor cortex that you know you have M1, M2, and then um, and then it just goes on and on like that with uh, higher and higher order cortical areas, um, instantiating higher and higher level motor plans um, in a way that recapitulates the hierarchical structure of behavior itself. Another idea is that PFC is operating as a kind of like state detector within the context of reinforcement learning. So that's what's being shown on the right here. So if you imagine that um, you know, an agent is doing some kind of RL task, but the state is not fully observable, then what PFC does is um, to do a kind of filtering on the environment to recognize the state that the animal is in and then maybe maintain that state in working memory. And if you think about it, both of these are actually compatible with this task. You could imagine that in this task, um, saying the color of the letters or saying the text of the letters, those are both in a way very, very high level motor plans. They, they are the, it's sort of like the highest level um, uh, parameter in a, in a hierarchical description of the current behavioral task that the person is doing. Uh, on the other hand, you could imagine that um, What's really happening is that there's a kind of filtering going on. You have to filter when the when the experimenter says to you, now you know, say the color that the words are written in, and then you have to maintain that in working memory. And so you're just sort of maintaining the state of the current task that you're in. Um, so again, these are like it's just sort of semantic this distinction that I'm making when it comes to the the Stroop task. But um, you can imagine that if you sort of generalize to the whole world of things that an animal does, then there might be some symmetry breaking between these two perspectives. And um, because I'm, I was in the data lab and what we mostly do is study, you know, animals just exploring uh, an arena as opposed to doing a task, um, I sort of uh, wondered, well, what if you just, what if there is no task? What if you try to sort of separate these two um, if you sort of break this symmetry, you just let a mouse walk around and do whatever it wants, um, which kind of, uh, which of these two um, frameworks will be more compatible with the activity that you see? And I want to uh, emphasize that almost the, I, I don't know what PFC um, contributes to the mouse's behavior in this context, if you just sort of dump it in an empty bucket and let it walk around, but, um, and I'm not going to answer that question here, but the question that I'm more focused on is just in, in, in you know, 
always when we're looking at PFC, we're trying, reasonably, we're trying to put the mouse in a situation where we know that PFC is necessary for whatever the mouse is doing. What if we just sort of drop that, let the mouse walk around, and then ask what uh, are the dynamics that we see? So that's the experiment that I'm going to tell you about. And as a, as a forecast, I'll say that I I'm, I'm end up being a little more partial to this theory on the right. So that's the argument that I'll make. Uh, all right, so the experiment that we did is basically to put a mouse in a open uh, arena in certain, um, certain of the recordings or in certain blocks of the report recording. We put a second mouse. We film the mice from above and below using depth cameras, um, measure the activity in the prelimbic cortex, which is an area of PFC in the mouse, using uh, one photon calcium imaging, and then record the behavior using a tool called MoSeq, which basically tries to discover um, a small dictionary of movement motifs, like a rear, a turn, a run, and then um, annotates the video uh, for which of those motifs is happening on each frame. So this is an example of what the recordings look like. Um, so uh, down here are the syllables, um, the movement motifs that are output by MoSeq. Here's the neural data sorted using raster map. And um, there's an uh, IR uh, video from the bottom camera. So you can see that there's um, some interesting dynamics here, you know, like various blocks of neurons turning on at different times. You can also see that most, it's sort of hard to imagine. I don't know if we, I, you guys have an intuition about what PFC is doing while the mouse is just scratching its butt and walking around and smelling stuff. Um, so, it, so it raises a kind of interesting question. Like I, I think a lot of the way that we think about PFC doesn't really prepare us to ask about what's the connection between these dynamics and these behaviors that, that don't feel very cognitive. Um, all right, well, the first thing is because we measure neural activity and we measure behavior. So just ask the simplest question, does the neural activity encode the behavior? Can you, de can you sort of um, decode one from the other? And so to, you, you actually can to a surprising degree. So um, on the left, I'm showing uh, a decoding of velocity. Uh, the gray here is the um, actual velocity and black is the decoded value. Uh, on the, the second row shows a zoomed in version of the top row, and you may notice that the neural dynamics are a bit slower than the behavioral dynamics, which is um, an observation I'll return to. You might also notice that the neural dynamics seem a bit delayed from the behavioral dynamics, which is another thing I'll return to. Um, but yeah, and then so, so these are just sort of scalar representations of behavior. Similarly, if we look at syllables or groupings of syllables, um, you can decode those pretty well from the neural activity. So in general, you sort of, you get a picture of what the mouse is doing just from looking in PFC. Um, now, if you think about the, um, these, these theories here, one of the predictions, you may say, you might say a prediction of both of them is that we don't really expect that PF, certainly in the, in the um, model on the left, you don't expect that PFC is encoding the moment-to-moment -moment motor actions of the mouse. You think that it's more encoding some sort of high-level um, behavioral state, which is uh, governing the more lower-level actions. And um, that is, uh, even though here we've I've, we've, I've just looked at the correlation between the high-level state, between the PFC and, um, and the mouse's moment-to-moment -moment actions. Uh, this is, these observations are actually compatible with the idea that what PFC is encoding is some kind of higher-order motor state, um, because higher-order motor states are going to have low-level correlates. But the fact that the PFC signal is a bit slow uh, compared to the behavioral state is a suggestion that maybe what, what's being encoded is actually somewhat higher level. So on the other hand, uh, that's one explanation of what's going on here. Another explanation is that uh, behavior is just encoded everywhere. It's encoded in a visual cortex. You know, it's not surprising that we see it in PFC. There's just a kind of efference copy of everything the mouse does going all over the brain. Uh, by the way, I, uh, you guys should interrupt with uh, questions or comments whenever you want. Um, so. 
you can imagine, so these, these two scenarios um, should be somewhat distinguishable by smoothing of the, if you do a kind of temporal smoothing. So if, if you have just behaviors, you know, um, there's an efference copy of behavior everywhere, um, then if you uh, smooth the behavioral signal, you should get a worse relationship to the neural data because you're just, you know, muddying your signal. On the other hand, if uh, PFC is encoding some sort of higher level behavioral state, um, then you would expect that smoothing would make the correlation somewhat better because a higher order behavioral state is defined not by, by what's happening instantaneously, but, but by in some kernel around the current moment. And what we find is that actually this, there does seem to be an improvement. So here um, on the x-axis is the degree of smoothing in the behavioral signal, and um, the red line is showing the accuracy of um, the correlation between the decoded and the actual value of the behavioral signal after we've smoothed the behavioral signal. So you can see that there is a, an improvement with smoothing. Um, the number that is, the actual number here, is the um, standard deviation on a Gaussian kernel. So if you think about, uh, if you sort of take that number and multiply it by four, you get um, basically like the 95% support interval for the kernel. So you can think that roughly what PFC seems to care about at a given moment is the average of the behavior within a 10 second interval around that moment. And um, if you look at a syllable level of representation of behavior shown on the right, you get a, a similar answer where, um, the P, where PFC seems to care about, you know, like a 10 syllable window or 10 syllable uh, kernel of smoothing around the current behavior. Now, one explanation of this is that our behavior signal might just be noisy and smoothing um, gets rid of that noise. But uh, interestingly, if we do this exact same analysis now using neural uh, signals derived from the dorsolateral striatum, which uh, we had obtained earlier in the lab, or from an earlier project in the lab, and um, had shown are more directly involved in motor control, you can see that smoothing doesn't really improve things. So for syllables, there's no amount of smoothing that improves this correlation. And for the behavioral scalar signals, you, the, it's about like a 10-fold, 8 to 10-fold, uh, less smaller smoothing window that optimizes the correlation between these signals. So it seems like in some way that's not just an artifact of how we're recording behavior. What PFC um, sort of cares about in the animal's behavior is living at a time scale which is uh, slower than the time scale at which we actually observe the behavior. So if we take seriously this idea that you know behavior is hierarchical, um, which which uh, I just wanted to include a, a slide on as a quick reminder, is a concept um, introduced by Tim Bergen in the in mid century. Um, so, for example, you know, an animal pursuing its reproductive drive is will have, will, you know, fight, build, court, et cetera, and each of those um, high-level behaviors consists of, act, you know, activities, and those activities break down into actions, and you can imagine continuing this hierarchy down to the level of individual uh, muscle contractions. So if we take seriously this idea that um, behavior is hierarchical, you can then ask the question, which level of this hierarchy um, best explains the the neural data, the neural signals that we see in prefrontal cortex. So um, the problem is that uh, we're not working with uh, sticklebacks, and we there's no we don't have a Nobel Prize winning ethologist to actually look at the mice and derive this hierarchy. So um, so in order to ask this question, we have to have a way of actually pulling out the behavioral hierarchy from the behavioral signals that we've recorded. So in order to do that, we developed this um, uh, hierarchical HMM. So this is a, um, so the, the generative model is depicted here. So there's the, so we record pose. There is a layer above pose, which is the most seek syllables, runs, turns, rears, et cetera. And above that, we're trying to explain the sequence, the non-stationarity and the transitions between these, um, between these behaviors using a higher order state. So, um, the idea is that these, these higher order, so this is a depiction of what the actual model looks like when it's fit. There's the pose data, the syllables, and the higher order states. And so each of these higher order states describes some sort of distribution over low level actions. And if we uh, just use the model itself, 
So, so there's actually, in, when fitting this model, there's a free parameter called the stickiness that uh, controls the time scale of transitions among the higher order states. So if you set a very high value of this hyperparameter, you have uh, very seldom transitions between high, like the higher order states would last tens of seconds or minutes. At a very low level, they'll just happen one after the other. In a kind of limit, you would just get one higher order state for each, for each behavior, and they would just transition at the same time scale as the behaviors. So we have to actually make a decision about um, how to set this parameter. Uh, and one thing that's interesting is that if you just look at the held out model likelihood, like the goodness of fit of the model that we get, it seems like it actually optimizes at this time scale of around um, you know, 12 seconds, 13 seconds, which is similar to the time scale that we saw uh, as, as sort of what PFC cared about in the behavior. So for now, um, I'm going to show you results for this uh, 10 to 12 second time scale of higher order states. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I have a just brief question. Um, it said that the higher order level is the distribution of the middle level. Yeah. Uh, but but um, I don't see the, in the in the left picture. Uh, I see that the direction comes from up to the direction of the arrows is from up to down. So how the distribution is dependent on this? Yeah. So. Um, I'm not sure. So yeah, the question is what what is what do, what do the direction of the arrows actually mean in this diagram? Um, so the uh, diagram on the left is a showing it's sort of a probabilistic graphical model. So the direction of the arrows says that in as a, written down as a generative model, we're sort of imagining a situation where the higher order state dictates the distribution of which syllable is used in the middle level state. When we actually fit this model to data, um, the, and this is sort of generally true for fitting generative models, the actual, the sort of, the causal flow of, of like bits through the computer goes in the reverse direction of the arrows. So we use the data that we see to fit the latent states of the model. But, but, the, um, but ultimately, we're trying to fit those latent states using a kind of, um, using uh, like a, yeah, our, a generative story, the way we sort of imagine that those, um, that the function of those states is to determine the distribution of, of behaviors. Yeah, so you can think of these arrows as more like telling a story about how we imagine the behavior is generated, uh, not necessarily how we actually do the fitting. Um, so I'm just going to walk through a couple examples of this. So we, we, if you fit this model, uh, you, if you fit it different, you know, the model has, there's some stochasticity in the process of fitting. We use Gibbs sampling. Um, so you get a kind of ensemble of model fits. Here I'm going to show you examples from just one of these samples from the ensemble of model fits in which we get five states. I'll show three examples here. So one is a grooming state. So um, in this figure, the heat map shows uh, like an example of a minute or so. And um, you can see and red shows which state is happening on each frame. Above, I'm showing uh, I've just taken a bunch of syllables and by hand labeled certain of them as grooming syllables by looking at uh, videos. And so, it, and, and so I've labeled this uh, top state as grooming because it appears to, I mean, if you just look at videos, the mouse is grooming when, the, when they're in this state. And uh, I, what I want to emphasize here is that they're not grooming continuously throughout this state, but there's clearly like a bout of grooming that starts at a particular time and ends at a particular time, and this model appears to be capturing those dynamics. Um, another, uh, so we also get a pair of states for when the mouse is just exploring the arena. And interestingly, these bifurcate into two different kinds of exploration. One where the mouse is going clockwise and the wall is on the left of the mouse, and the other where the mouse is going counterclockwise and the wall is on the right. That might seem like a, a sort of trivial distinction. It turns out, as I'll try to argue later, it, it, it's not from the perspective of the brain. But um, it's also not a trivial, it's also a distinction that the model makes because when the mouse uh, is, has the wall on its left, it keeps turning one way. And when the wall's on the other side, it keeps turning the other way. And so you get different distributions of syllables in these two different situations. Um, I'll also be referring a lot throughout the rest of the talk to this ego, egocentric wall direction um, uh, variable, which is just a quantification of whether the, mount, the wall's on the left or the right side of the mouse. 
Um, there's also a state for social exploration. So here is um, the distance between the two mice. And um, so here you can see during this period in which the mice are, are interacting, um, the social interaction state is occurring. And there's also a pausing state that I'm not showing. So um, it turns out that these um, higher order states actually do provide a much um, cleaner description of the neural activity than the low level behaviors did. So on the left, I'm showing the, uh, an example of trying to predict the high level uh, state from the neural activity. Um, so, and um, so there's, a, there's a confusion matrix that shows uh, just across all recordings and states the accuracy of um, the real versus predicted state. And um, here you can see the, um, the accuracy compared to other ways of segmenting the behavior, one in terms of just the, so you can take syllables and instead of grouping them, instead of grouping, uh, instead of sort of determining five states using this higher order model, you can just take the syllables and group them into five clusters based on how similar they are to each other. Um, so that would, so for example, in that case, you also get a grooming cluster, but it has these fast dynamics. It, it does, it's not slow the way the HMM state is. And um, that does a lot worse in terms of uh, if you try to decode that from neural activity, you, you can't do it as well. Um, and if you look at the, interestingly, if you look at the entire ensemble of um, higher order of, of fits of this model, including fits where you change the time scale at which the states are inferred, you actually get a similar picture where the, um, the time scale, the, the fit to the relationship between the neural data and the higher order model fit is greatest when the higher order model states last between, between 10 and 20 seconds. So this appears to be um, a time scale in behavior that is um, both produces sort of, it, it provides the best fit to the behavioral data itself, and it also provides the best fit to the neural data. Can you give some intuition what point 0.15 means in terms of how good it performs to, to tell us what the behavior is from the neural activity? Um, so I think that probably this, uh, in terms of like an actual effect size, right. this confusion matrix is maybe the best um, way to just get an intuition for it. So, you know, roughly, so according to this confusion matrix, you know, roughly like half the time, if you try to predict what state you're in, um, you're right on half of the frames and on the other half of frames, you sort of are randomly wrong picking one of the other states. Um, and then I don't uh, have a similar matrix for these, um, for this one, but you know, for this, it's, it sort of looks you know, like this, but just way more muddy and, um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, so sort of half, half on, half off, and you have five states, so the chance level would be 0.2. Yeah. Okay. Um, so another way to look at this, so there's, all of these analyses rely on trying to decode from the neural activity, but that gives you a kind of incomplete picture because you could have 10% of the neurons being a very faithful um, signal that, that reports on the state while 90% of the neurons are just doing other stuff. So um, another way to look at this is to just try to build a low dimensional manifold that represents you know, all the different um, states that the, higher, that the neural uh, signal can be in and then ask, how well these behavioral states segregate within this um, neural manifold. So here I'm showing um, just the, the pipeline that we used to do that. So we just take the, the neural dynamics, do a principal components analysis to get like a low D manifold. And then um, on top of that, you can do UMAP, uh, like a nonlinear embedding of the PCA to get a 2D picture. Um, I'll use the 2D picture for illustration, although all the actual analyses are done in the PCA space, which is, I think we use like five dimensions for the PCA space. So if you do that, you can see, so this is, this, this type of analysis is annoying because you have to do it um, separately on every single recording. Um, if anyone has good thoughts on how to make joint neural manifolds across individuals, that seems to be like a, yeah, I'd love to hear more about that. 
Um, so here I'm showing one example of recording, and this is one of the this is the neural manifold from that recording, and you can see that um, the these higher order behavioral states seem to segregate to different areas, which suggests that uh, it's not that they're they're not sort of being encoded by 10% of the neurons, but they're being encoded, but the the sort of principal low dimensional axes of variation within the neural signal correspond to these um, distinctions in behavior. And um, you can similarly, through like a K nearest neighbor analysis that, who's, that, that I won't go into, you can try to sort of formally look at how well these states segregate from each other in the neural state space. And again, you see a similar, um, you get a similar result that the segregation is better for the higher order states than for like a kinematic clustering or some kind of um, segmentation that's just based on the syllable representation of behavior. Can you really say that this is not distributed across a small number of neurons? I mean, the loadings of the PCs could be super sparse. Yes, yeah. So, um, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'd actually be curious yeah, how many neurons. So it could be that it's, it's distributed across many neurons, but it, it's only a small fraction of the variance in each of those neurons, but it's just, but just all the remaining variance is, yes, yeah, split across, is sort of uncorrelated. Um, or yeah, it could be that there's a small group of highly correlated um, neurons and uh, that capture all the signal. So yeah, so we can't, the, at this point, it doesn't say how many neurons are involved, but it just says that the, um, yeah, the, the sort of low, principal low dimensional axes, the most correlated axes correspond to this. Um, all right, so, Everything I've just shown you um, gives us a, a bit of a better sense of what's going on in, in PFC uh, when mice are just going around scratching their butts, smelling other mouse, uh, other mice. But um, I, I think we still don't really have a lot of insight into the distinction between these two models. So um, you could imagine that what's happening is uh, that this everything I've shown you could be compatible with the model on the left. In fact, it could be that PFC is actually controlling these high-level states, that PFC is really acting as a kind of high-level motor controller that is you know, specifying, you know, now it's time to groom, now it's time to explore, now it's time to investigate the other mouse. Um, and, what we're, and the signals that we're seeing in PFC are the kind of the manifestation of this control, that those signals are actually being interpreted by other areas of the brain, say by lower level motor cortices in order to implement the behaviors. Another possibility is that um, when the mouse is in these different uh, behavioral states, those also constitute different like contextual states for the context of reinforcement learning. Like maybe while I'm investigating another mouse, that's, that's the sort of a context in which I want to associate certain actions with reward or in which I want to learn certain things. So, um, so we, don't, we still don't know which of these two models is, uh, is sort of in force here. But one prediction we can make is that if it's the model on the left, if what we're seeing is actually the, um, a control process in action, then the signals we see in PFC should happen before the behavior, or they should at least begin before the behavior starts. But that's manifestly not what we see at all. As I mentioned at the beginning, it really seems like the neural signal is delayed compared to the behavioral signal. So you can look at this in a couple ways. Um, one is just to do like a simple cross-correlation analysis. So if I take the actual measured behavioral signal and uh, cross-correlate it with the decoded version of that signal, then um, what you see across every signal that you look at is that there's a roughly half second delay between the actual behavioral signal and uh, what's encoded in PFC. You can also see this at the level of the higher order behavior states. So this is, um, these heat maps show the average um, activity in each neuron uh, aligned to all the initiation points of, for each of these states. And so um, what I hope is clear is that in general, these neurons are turning on after the state has already started uh, with you know, different degrees of delay. But in almost no case do we see that the neuron turns on before the state. Are these layer two, three neurons are layer five, or you don't know? Because they, they could be different behavioral coding in, in different layers of cortex. Yeah, it's a really great question. I don't know. The way the actual recording is um, 
we've, uh, we're using a grin lens, and so at, at the point we're looking at, the cortical surface is, is sort of, is like vertical. And so the, the grin lens is positioned such that, you know, in theory we're seeing a cross section um, that m might include all these layers, although in practice, I'm not sure if the layer five. So probably these are mostly layer two, three neurons. I'm not sure to what extent layer five is represented. Mm -hmm. um, did you deconvolve the Gaussian signals? Because the indicators have a delay as well, right? Yeah, so we didn't, I'll show you an analysis. On the next slide, we'll, be, uh, we'll look at the derivative of the, um, of the calcium signals, which uh, is a bit more of a faithful representation of the spikes. In general, the calcium, the indicator um, half-life, I mean, so the rise time is usually pretty fast, you know, tens of milliseconds, and then the decay time is, is you know, and the low is like 100 milliseconds or something. So um, you might get a little bit of delay from that, but the time scales um, involved are, are sort of an order of magnitude smaller than the delays that we're seeing in the data. Is one, is one P so much faster? I'm just wondering, because typically you see these 500 milliseconds sort of bouts of, of stuff. Um, you can see, so I think 500 milliseconds, you might see 500 milliseconds on the, for the, like the decay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you would never see that on the rise time, but here you do see, you know, like a thousand milliseconds, even for this neuron, just to start turning on. Um, but yeah, no, it is, whatever, um, even if that, those dynamics don't totally explain this, they do muddy the picture. Like we're not getting a very precise. So we are, we're doing electrophysiology uh, now to try to get a better sense of it. But um, yeah. So um, you can also uh, look at this more systematically. So if you um, try to, if you look at the decoded, um, you try to predict the probability of each of these states from the neural data, and then you look at that predicted probability aligned to the onset of the states. What you can see is that, uh, or to the offset, so you can see that when a state turns off, it's only once the state has ended that, the, that you actually, when you try to pre that the predicted probability from the PFC starts to go down. And similarly, when a state starts, in this case, like it takes five full seconds for the actual predicted probability of that state from the PFC to rise to its uh, full level. So, so the, yeah, and then um, here you can see this shows the derivative of the signals above. So, I mean, in some of these cases, you might think that, you know, it started to go up just before, even if the, the um, neural correlate of a behavioral state hasn't fully manifested by the time the state starts, you might think that it's sort of beginning to manifest ahead of time. But if you look at this a little more systematically uh, at the level of the derivative, you can see even the derivative doesn't start to rise until the behavioral state has started. So it really seems like the, the mouse is, switches what it's doing and only then does um, the representation in PFC start to change. Uh, now I want to emphasize that I'm not trying to say here that PFC is like totally inert and not doing anything in this situation. Um, what I am saying, I mean, it's totally possible that at, at particular moments, uh, PFC has a decisive influence on what's happening, um, or that a subset of the neurons have, a, have an ongoing influence on what's happening. But if you just sort of take all time points, all neurons, and you average everything together, then um, by far the dominant signal appears to be driven by a kind of behavior to, to neural activity, causal arrow, and not the other way around. So um, I, I'm, you, even if you could sort of isolate a certain kind of situation here in which PFC did influence what's going on, you still have to explain like 95% of the signal here in terms of a causal arrow going the other way around. And so uh, the subsequent slides are going to try to explain that. Um, although, if, yeah, if people have ideas about how to, one, one thing we're struggling with here is how to think about the causality. So, you know, we're, we might just, we're just going to lesion PFC and see if anything uh, changes. But um, that sort of, like, it, it would be a straw man to think that, like, oh, the whole structure of behavior will collapse and all, you know, they'll lose all time scales in their behavior when that happens. So uh, it would be, if people have ideas about more um, subtle changes to look at or more subtle perturbations to PFC activity, um, I'd love to hear them. Sorry, I'm not a, robot, uh, not a neuroscientist. Um, 
is are these really two separate theories, or is it possible that both of these things? Are true? Um, so you could. Well, there, there's certainly um, the, the reason why I'm asking is that we have in robotics an architecture that looks, you know, information processing that looks like what you have on the left, but it does what you have shown on the right. So it's one implementation that does both. Uh, and so I, that's why I'm wondering. Yeah, well, so, yeah, one problem is that the, the model on the left doesn't come with the mathematical formalism. It's only, like, if you, if you, could have, if you mathematically formalize the model on the left, you could just ask, do these four, are these two formalisms, like, uh, sort of equivalent in some sense? Sure, yeah. In a way, the, the thing on the right is much more, like, quantitatively well-defined. The thing on the left is kind of like an idea. Um, so in that sense, um, I don't know exactly what the people who, who drew the picture on the left were thinking. I think in my mind... Uh, <laughs> what yeah. are they thinking? <laughs> in, in my mind, the, the difference is that um, in the picture on the left, the, the sort of signal in, in PFC like specifies a policy, whereas um, you know, in, in this formalism at least, the policy is is specified elsewhere. Like in this policy, this is policy execution and update. Mm -hmm. but th th that's obviously totally compatible with each other. So I I'm just wondering. You say two theories. To, to me, it's one theory. Could it be that it's one theory? Well, yeah, and I think so. I think the other distinction is that um, if you imagine that. Uh, so I think, the, in, as I mentioned at the beginning, like in the situation where you have a task in which the state that you're in just determines what you should do, they kind of collapse into one theory. There's not a meaningful distinction between them. But if you're in a, if you're like just a mouse walking around, um, I think in that case it's a little bit easier to think about the distinction. You know, is it the case that? Um, I mean, I think what I've hopefully what the. Uh, or what I've interpreted from all the data that I just showed you is that mice are perfectly capable of acting in a hierarchical way without PFC dictating that hierarchy. So, um, but it could be that even in this sort of offline uh, sense, when they're not like, you know, using any policy that requires PFC, that PFC is still sort of acting as a, as a filter to try to do like state estimation in case something happens with the mouse, you know, later uh, learns is, is like useful to add to its policy function. So I think it's mostly in this offline scenario that, that a meaningful distinction, distinction arises. Yeah, I mean, on that note, in a sense, if you had such a hierarchical organization of behavior, then I guess you would try to choose your high level actions or options or whatever you want to call that based on high level states that you've inferred. And then the question is just, if that decision making is happening in PFC, you might just have both present, right? That both basically a high level state is present and a high level you know, action choice is present. And then it's the, just the question of how is this distributed across, across the neurons? And what you call high level goals, right? I mean, they dictate lower level goals, yeah. right? I mean, so, so goals are popping up everywhere and this is just drawn hierarchically, I think as an artifact of, of you know, postdoc artifact. Basically, this is just connected, and depending on what you're trying to achieve, the hierarchy looks different. Right? Yeah. But I think where, where Caleb is right is that the delay is the problem here, right? That is it. I don't know whether we are already in the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't mean to do yeah, another presentation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in a way, it's, it, I mean, if you would do a, a fMRI study, it's difficult to let people walk around while they're on the scanner, but um, if you would be able to do that, presumably you wouldn't find a lot of um, uh, PFC activity. Um, nevertheless, you would be able to decode some information from PFC in a way. And they, I mean, also if you, if you show faces, you have from face areas that decode the information, but you can also decode it from other areas. That means there is a kind of aftershadow of what's happening elsewhere in other parts of the brain. The question is, is that relevant? And also, if you don't really have a task that involves really this area, can you then draw these conclusions? Or wouldn't you need a task that really requires this higher order policy? Or well, I think, you know, for um, fusiform face area, uh, right. you, can de you, you decode faces. Yeah. But, um, 
So that's a very informative thing. But you can also do that from, from uh, I mean, you can also decode when excluding faces from, from other areas, when excluding fusiform face areas. Because right. there is information about this in a different ways everywhere in the brain. Right, right. So I think the, um, yeah, that is, that is a, a huge challenge. But uh, you can imagine that in fusiform face area, if you had to pick one aspect of, of what's happening in the environment to best explain the variance in fusiform face area, you might pick faces. Um, and other areas, even though fit, you can decode faces, um, if you sort of filtered the signal in another way, you would maximize the, the correlation. So, um, But if I look at fusiform face area where they see houses, you will presumably be able to decode houses to some degree. Right, right. Um, yeah. So I think the question this is, in my opinion, what you are doing here. You are looking at prefrontal cortex while they are not doing a prefrontal task. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think so. The the argument, the motivation here is that um, while the yet can you or can you not decode it is sort of like I think what we've learned is like yes, you can usually decode it. So the so then it's more of a quantitative question, like mm -hmm. for different filters of the input signal does that help you decode it better or worse? And in that way, you're sort of approximating. What, um, what aspects of the signal are most relevant, you know? Like, even these different areas are not totally equipotential in terms of how they're wired into the network. And so then the question is, what kinds of information are more privileged in reaching them? Yeah. Yeah, also uh, related to this, um, so the question whether the PFC is like determining anything or being determined by, by lower yeah. contextual input and stuff. Do I get it right that in this setup, the mice um, don't really have to inhibit um, behaviors or like really use kind of higher level cognitive states or stuff that they're just kind of moving through and doing So there's, we, we are not, um, there's nothing that we've imposed on them that would require them to do that. It, it could be, I mean, that's sort of like, PFC does something, you know, it's not like a, you know, quantum mechanics where it requires the, the uh, observation of a human. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know in general, like when PFC is sort of used under ethological settings in a mouse's normal life and whether what we're doing here includes any of those settings. Um, but it does seem like uh, you would think that if, if inhibition from PFC were profoundly important on a moment to moment basis and dictating what the mice were doing, that then you would see some precedence of the neural signal. Not even necessarily inhibition, but like uh, just, um, I, I would be very curious about have maybe having these same mice or, or similar mice in a, in a different setup where they needed to make some sort of choice or, or use memory or, or whatever, like something something that just takes a bit more like, um, yeah, high level processing in order to determine a behavior. And then whether whether we might, we might not even see um, that same area that you doing those things with less of a lag and more of a lead. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, presumably you would. Um, I mean, as many people have observed in the past, I mean, there's plenty of cases where you do see a lead when you actually, when they've isolated a particular moment and circumstance in which PFC is necessary. Um, all right, so I know there's not that much time left, but there's, um, so uh, I do think we can get some more insight into what PFC is doing or what, what it's sort of set up to do in this context by um, looking at, um, the way that it encodes uh, external variables. So, um, so the idea is that there's uh, basically like we think about PFC being involved in tasks, and so let's if we start to take imagine that these high-level behavioral states constitute tasks, and then ask what are the task variables within those tasks, and to what extent are they encoded in the activity. So, um, so the two dominant states that. Uh, we see um, in this particular assay are just wall following. So the mouse is basically just exploring and it's following the wall clockwise or counterclockwise. And it, um, its distance to the wall fluctuates somewhat and the side of the, and the angle of, to, the egocentric angle to the wall also fluctuates. So um, interestingly, both of these signals are represented really well in uh, prefrontal activity the direction to the wall and the distance to the wall in a way that um, even though they are, especially wall direction, as I mentioned, is correlated with behavior. So if the wall's on the left, the mouse keeps turning to the right. Um, these, uh, these signals are well correlated even if you've been by behavior. So in a way that seems to be independent of behavior, you see a strong representation in PFC of whether the wall is on the left or the right and how close it is. 
Um, that you see similar delay dynamics in that case. So, um, for example, if we wait for the mouse to like just turn around so that before the wall was on one side and now the wall's on the other side, um, and then you look at the uh, decoded position of the wall, it doesn't start to change until after the mouse has already turned around. Um, I'll skip this slide. But um, one thing that's uh, interesting is that this, and that gives a sense of, of what, I think a little more insight into what PFC might be doing, is that this um, signal is not uniform in time. So it actually depends on the, on the behavior that the mouse is doing. So um, I haven't introduced you to this uh, graphic, but if you kind of do a low dimensional uh, like manifold of the mouse's behavior, you can see that there's a certain area for grooming and a certain area for exploration. And we see that the neurons that encode the direction of the wall are only active when the mouse is actively exploring. Um, even though when the mouse is grooming, the wall is still on one side of the mouse or the other. Um, and in fact, there seems to be a kind of gain change depending on the current state of the mouse. So for example, if you, during uh, grooming, if you sort of look as a function of whether the wall is fully on the mouse's left, fully on the mouse's right, or somewhere, or you know, somewhere behind it, um, you can see that conditional on the same angle, the corresponding PFC, the activity of neurons that encode the direction of the wall seems to be higher when the mouse is actively exploring. Um, so, I don't know, does this, uh, I'm sort of rushing through this because there's only a couple minutes left, but I don't know if, if, uh, if anything's ask, unclear. We questions in between as well. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, and if you try to decode the position of the, the direction of the wall or the closeness of the wall, the, um, your ability to decode that signal is much higher when the mouse is actively following the wall as opposed to doing these other behaviors, during which the wall still has a certain distance to the mouse and a, and a direction to the mouse. Um, you can also see this uh, if you do perturbations that actively change the relevance of the wall. So one thing we noticed and then uh, followed up with, um, exper with uh, targeted experiments is that when the mouse um, gets attacked by another mouse, uh, it really, it, it sort of adheres closer to the wall after being attacked as a kind of classic anxiety response. And um, so here, for example, we did an experiment where we have uh, a mouse and then we, we keep putting it, we either have no mouse that's gray, no partner mouse, or we put in an aggressive partner or a non-aggressive partner. And up here I'm showing instances of attack, so you can see that the aggressive partner in red tends to attack, whereas the non-aggressive partner never attacks. And then if you sort of zoom in on one of these instances <laughs> of attack, you can see that um, if you sort of sort the neurons into neurons that are active when the wall is on one side versus on the other side, the coherence and strength of that signal um, for the wall direction becomes uh, much stronger and more pronounced after the mouse has been attacked. You can also see that the mouse at that point stays slightly closer to the wall and persists for longer periods with the wall being on either the left or the right. Um, and so you can sort of formally quantify this so on average, after attacks, mice get slightly closer to the wall, um, which you can, during aggressive blocks, they're in general closer to the wall. And um, during aggressive blocks, they tend to be more sort of straight parallel to the wall as opposed to at different angles from it. Um, and correspondingly, when mice uh, get attacked, the um, neural signal for, uh, that encodes the direction to the wall becomes much more pronounced. Um, and the same thing for the neural signal that encodes um, the proximity of the wall. But, uh, so what I've just shown you is that behavior changes and the neural signal changes. But the neural signal, uh, but those are not sort of, the change in behavior doesn't fully explain the change in the neural signal. So even if you condition on the exact same behavior, on the same um, direction to the wall or on the same distance to the wall, even after conditioning, you still see this um, increase like a kind of gain change in the response of the neurons uh, to these different um, parameters about the wall position. So in other words, PFC contains a kind of code for things, for variables in the external environment, but that code is evolving in time depending on changes in the salience of those um, variables in the environment. 
And so if you put all these things together, you kind of get a picture where um, you have this sort of overall manifold of activity in PFC. The manifold at a gross level can be chopped up into territories that seem to correspond to these high level uh, states that the mouse is in. And, um, and then within each of these high level states, what's going on in that part of the manifold is an encoding of uh, external variables that are sort of relevant to the mouse when the mouse is in that state. And um, if there's questions I can go into this, you sort of, you can generalize this to other things, like if you put novel objects into the arena, you see, uh, you get like a novel object investigation state that ha occupies a certain part of the neural manifold. You see improved in uh, encoding of like the identity or distance of the object when the mouse is in that state. And so um, this appears to be like a sort of generalizable like schema for thinking about what PFC um, does in this sort of freely moving, task-free uh, scenario, which I think is, I should have put this slide at the end, compatible with this idea that in an offline setting, PFC's job is to sort of maintain, represent, to, to act as a kind of filter over states in the environment to uh, maintain a representation so that if something does happen that the mouse needs, that is relevant for learning, um, then that sort of exists as a policy uh, that the PFC has sort of represents that so that um, you know downstream areas that receive dopaminergic input say can can sort of update the policy of what the mouse uh, should do and they always have this representation of the state available. Right. In human terms, we call that situational awareness. Uh, right. Do you say that's the same concept? Um, you'll have to. I don't. Uh, it depends. I don't know what that means, um, but it sounds. It does sound relevant based on, <laughs> based on the title. Um, just before I finish, I just wanted to thank all the people who um, helped collect uh, the data for this project and, um, and uh, you guys for having me here. I really appreciate it. All right, thank you.